the most powerful graphics card in the world. A title that both AMD and Nvidia are constantly fighting over, but in recent years it's only really been Nvidia that's dominated the scene with AMD left in the dust. But if we go back a few years, how exactly is the case? This right here is the AMD Gradient HD 4870X2, and when I said we were going back a few years, what I really meant was that we were going back near on a decade ago. Back in 2008, when AMD, or ATI, however you want to call it, they were the same company anyway, released this very graphics card. Built on the R700 XT variant of the Terascale architecture, it's a bit more complicated than it sounds, but ultimately it's two HD 4850s stuck together onto one graphics card. Ultimately, it has 1600 shading units, which is 800 per card, and a total of 2GB of GDDR5 VRAM, clocking in at 900 MHz. Now, only 1GB is usable given the nature of these dual GPUs, and on paper, it does in fact sound pretty impressive, especially for 2008. But these dual graphics cards always do. Anyway, you know, AMD always had their fair share of issues with these graphics cards. In fact, Nvidia did with these dual graphics cards as well. But AMD with this release aimed for it to be a viable performer, and something you'd actually want to buy for its initial £399 price tag, which in today's world for a top-of-the-line graphics card isn't actually too bad. So while I give this card a bit of a clean, as the condition of this card isn't really the best, why don't we discuss a little bit more about what makes this card so special. Well, what can I do other than start off with saying just how praised this card was by reviewers of the era? People were sceptical. I mean, the last time AMD, or Nvidia for that fact, had done something like this, you know, it worked alright, but it had its own major faults, specifically with the scaling and some titles and the fact that it was an expensive card that didn't really feel like a premium product. It felt a bit clunky. And even in my own review, that was a major issue with the card. So people were sceptical as AMD claimed it was the fastest graphics card in the world. But for once, unlike last time, you know, they were right. They heard the cries of the people and the previous issues they had, and they returned with this wonderful feat of a graphics card, returning near constant 5 star reviews all round from anyone that managed to get hold of one. It seemed like the card was more than just pretty good. And why wouldn't it be? AMD saw the main issues with the card were driver side issues as well as the limited bandwidth caused by the PCIe 1 connection. Because of course the two graphics cards were connected together by twice the bandwidth via the PCIe i.e. 2 connection. But that's not all they did to future-proof it in a sense, AMD had also cross-connected the graphics cards via their own special bridge, called the side port because it was off the side of the GPU cores, something that wasn't enabled on release because the card already had so much bandwidth with its disposal that in true AMD fashion might as well not have needed to be there because when pushed for a release date by any reviewers, they didn't really have an answer because they never really planned to use it unless it really needed to be used. Its main competition was the top spot held by the GTX 2. As if you wanted more performance than the current AMD solution, which was the HD 4850 or 4890, well, you had to go for the NVIDIA option. I mean, there wasn't much reason to go for something that wasn't the AMD solution, because it was a good era for AMD. The HD 4000 series, although not matching that top spot, you know, it was much cheaper, so it was only really a case of the top-end enthusiasts and the fanboys buying into the GTX 200 series, because virtually in all tests, AMD was able to outperform them and were usually cheaper too. With this card, aimed at the top spot, you know, they wanted to change that. They wanted to prove that they could have the top spot, and there was no doubt that AMD had a good card on the market. Although there's one thing to note about this card. Well, it was only ever as good as its drivers, and we all know that TerraScale, well, it had some decent drivers in the beginning, but, well, now they're downright terrible. So why don't we take a look at if this graphics card has become 10-year-old treasure, or if it's just become a hot potato ruined by the poor AMD final drivers. So we're going to be testing this on my R5 1600 system to see just how well it performs. But as I said, it only really needs a single PCIe slot, so you can use just about any board absolutely fine. So why don't we get into this and find out just how well this thing is holding up in the benchmarks. Up first we have the likes of CSGO, which was running perfectly fine, which surprised me at first because the game was scaling near perfectly, with both GPUs running at virtually 100% utilisation the entire time. Occasionally one of them would drop down a few percent, but it was completely playable all round and we didn't exactly see much in the way of frame drops or even micro stuttering. It was a completely playable and moderately competitive experience from all the way to 720p all the way up to 1080p. I personally found the games to run fine, however I will 
will say that Danger Zone, the Battle Royale mode, is really a no-go on a card like this, as for some reason with X-Fire enabled, the game will just crash out, and you can still hear and control everything that's going on, but you'll be on the desktop and can't actually see what's going on, and I found no way of getting around this other than actually disabling one of the graphics cards, in which case the frame rate tanks and it's not really a playable experience. But still, it was relatively playable overall, and I was quite impressed by how well the game scaled on this graphics card. Next up is a much newer title with the likes of Sims 4, which did actually use Crossfire. Now you have to keep in mind that the card has no drivers to figure out exactly how the game is going to work, so it has no idea how to scale properly. But I was surprised how well the card was attempting to keep things in check. One card was seeing moderately high utilization for the majority of the time, while the other one was a bit shy of 40% utilization for the majority of the time we spent playing the game. The game was still playable, and with heightened settings we did see more scaling, but with this the game's frame rate also suffered. It wasn't unplayable, even with ultra settings in 1080p, but still, it became more of a limit of the graphics card itself than the crossfire scaling at those resolutions, so we were better off sticking to medium and high settings, but still with a very high 1080p resolution, and there wasn't much in the way of stuttering. Another impressive feat once again was the likes of Battlefield 3, which showed that the card is very capable of keeping up in heavy situations, and Crossfire once again was holding up pretty well. Well, with 64 player battles that is, which sees a lot of action going on a lot of the time, so it's quite intense to play, we saw the game was perfectly playable with medium settings if you were using 720p, and if you didn't mind the 30fps experience, you know 1080p wasn't off the table. But still it showed once again that there was a limit of the card itself more than the driver side implementation of Crossfire. I'm pretty impressed so far with how well this graphics card's been scaling, because once again, there wasn't much in the way of stutter, and any drops in frame rate seemed to be more of an issue with the card itself, rather than the driver implementation or crossfire. Back to the realms of real world gaming that you'd probably like to try on this card and games like Skyrim. You know, they're going to work pretty well, and you'll see pretty decent scaling, you can target higher resolutions and higher settings as well. Something this card was praised for back in the day, although they were mostly testing at the even higher resolution of 600p, and we're sticking to 1080p here. But you get where I'm coming from, for your modern day high resolution, well, relatively high resolution needs, you know, the card is extremely viable to use. I've experienced virtually no issues while using it, no micro stutter or anything like that, something that's quite common for a dual GPU to have, and I just haven't had any problems with it so far. Next up is one of the most intensive DirectX 10 titles out there, but also a very well optimized game with GTA 5. Which was a weird one, see, the card was running okay, and we were getting the usual terror scale related issues that you'd expect. See, these games need dedicated drivers to run well, because it's a very large open world game, and if you didn't have the latest Catalyst version or the Nvidia equivalent when it came out, it didn't run very nice. But this series of graphics cards never got them. And if you threw Crossfire into the mix, well, it's never been pretty before. But see, this is where things get very weird. I was messing about changing resolutions quite quickly from 720p to 900p to 1080p, back down to 800 by 600 and 720p again, just to see what would happen and how the game was performing at different resolutions. But after rapidly changing resolution, it messed the GPU side utilization and it caused it to stay up on both sides of the card, something that you very rarely see even with a single card in the game like this. You know, they never see full utilization. I had to do an entire video on custom drivers on the HD4890, and that was the only other case where I could get the game running well, but in the end, with this weird bug that somehow caused the utilization to stick up, I got the game to run alright in 720p and 1080p, and I haven't officially benchmarked these settings because it was a bit of a weird situation to set up, but I did get some video evidence of it with 720p and 1080p, and I'll leave a link down in the description if anyone wants to see that, because it, it's quite strange. Finally, to round us off, we had Killing Floor 2, which is a relatively new game all round, and it shows a very similar case to CSGO's Danger Zone. And it shows where the key issues lie, in a sense where it'll work okay, but stability was a problem. And I know I've been praising this card for being relatively stable all round, but in certain titles like this, you know, you end up with problems that shouldn't really be there. Changing any graphic settings would prompt a crash, and although scaling worked okay, we were generally being carried by a single card alone, hence the lower resolution and lower settings tested. The 3D mark was strange, in a sense that for once, it didn't actually show much in the way of scaling, regardless of the tests or scaling slash crossfire method I used. 
Maybe I was just messing up a bit on my own with my benchmarking, but from Google searches that I could find, they showed consistency with what I managed to get on my own benchmarking run, which places the card as better than a GTX 260, but worse than a HD 4890, around where you'd expect a higher clocked HD 4870 to be. I suppose as a single card that sounds about right, but with scaling, well we know that this card can do so much more than that, and we've seen it in the benchmarks, and for once, you know, 3D Mark's usually a good go-to on real world performance, so to see it this low is a bit strange. So how was it under usual usage? Well, AMD was pioneering these cars to be common use, and under normal use cases, well, it's relatively quiet and the card virtually powers down completely, which helps with power consumption as well as noise levels. Although the card was perfectly fine for watching videos with, using the desktop, word processing, all the things like that. I mean, I've used it for near on a week now, I even uploaded and exported a video, the hit goblin-based content that goes on the second channel, although one issue I did notice was that the card suffered heavily with live streaming, with OBS, XSplit, anything I tested, it suffered. Now I enabled VSync and tried changing the APIs being used, etc, but it made no difference and nothing would solve the issue. So on the latest streams, which I'll show on screen now, you can see a slight bit of frame tearing, which wasn't actually from the game, but was caused by the graphics card in post. I tried this on another system and it still happened, so yep, this seems to be one area where the card does suffer. But mostly though, the card has blown me away by how usable it is. It doesn't like my main monitor, which is another minor hiccup, but once you get past the little issues, you know, it's a decent card to use, and it's actually gone beyond my expectations in terms of stability and crossfire performance. In fact, I'd actually go up there to say what is one of the best cards I've used on the channel. So in conclusion, this card was of a different era. That much I'm pretty sure you all knew. But it blew me away just how well it worked in the modern day, once you get past the API limitations. It's a really competent card. Yes, it eats through power and chucks out a ton of heat, and if you stress it too much it sounds like a bloody jet engine. But these aren't exactly the worst things in existence, and definitely areas you can avoid. In fact, these are little issues you can look over, because with headphones, well, the noise isn't too bad. Any minor issues, well, there are workarounds, which is still annoying but nothing too bad, and I was able to use the graphics card as my main GPU for well on over a week. I tried out some new titles with people and didn't have many issues other than that one issue with Danger Zone, but you know how it can be with some of these older complex graphics cards and modern titles. Honestly, I was surprised how little in the way I had of issues with this graphics card, given that I tried a lot of these older dual GPUs before. In fact, I'd be willing to say that given the care, design and attention that went into making this graphics card, well, it was even easier to use than the newer HD 5970 that you can see on the channel. Now, I went into this video expecting pretty bad things, and I've left, well, pleasantly surprised. AMD managed to pull something off. Yes, it was complicated. Yes, it was rather obnoxious in terms of design, but in no way was it actually all that bad. It was relatively clever. It was supported well, and okay, I had to install the drivers manually, but even on an OS like Windows 10, it worked fine. On Windows 7, the drivers do install normally, though. I'd have to say, it worked fine in a modern AM4 PC, it was perfectly usable, and honestly, I had no problems using it at all. So thank you very much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this video as much as I've enjoyed using this graphics card. Good night. Now I'd like to say a huge thank you to all my patrons who have helped make these videos possible by allowing me to buy these graphics cards, so thank you very much for supporting the channel. I'd also like to say a special thank you to Darkness Fools, who's been doing a load of We'll Be Back art for the secondary channel when I've been streaming, so thank you very much for that. If you'd like to check out those streams, they are available, and I'll put a link down below.